Welcome to another episode of the Ask Historians podcast. Today we have an absolutely fascinating history of the comic book and the very first superheroes, courtesy of Caitlin Smith Oye Koye. But as it is the first episode of the month, we have the Ask Historians book giveaway. This is a giveaway for our Patreon supporters of $1 a month and up. For $5, for $1 you get one drawing, $5 gets you two, and $10 gets you three. Please do support us on patreon.com slash historians as it helps to going to keep this show going and where else can you get such fantastic historical content. The winner this month will get to pick from a book recommended by interview today about the topic today, which I will send you an email to you, or they can choose from Obscenity Rules, Roth versus United States in a Long Struggle Over Sexual Expression by Whitney Strube, which is a legal history of obscenity law in the United States that I am currently reading. Or they can choose a historical fiction, of which this month we have The Well of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall, which was a groundbreaking lesbian fiction book that was put on trial in England and America immediately after publication. The winner this month is Matthew W. Congratulations, Matthew. I will email you at your Patreon address. Now, here's the show. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Ask Historian podcast. I am very pleased today to be your host, Brian Watson, and we are thrilled today to have Ask Historians flared user, my dearest Angelica, better known to her friends and family as Caitlin Smith Oyekoye, a PhD candidate in American literature from the University of Notre Dame, where she focuses on doubt in American literature from the Great Awakening to the Civil War. Previous projects have focused on print culture and musical practice in colonial New England and the incipient crisis of authority in 16th century radical Protestant rhetoric and more. She's here today, however, to talk to us about the history of the superhero narrow from golden age superheroes to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. First things first, welcome to the Ask Historian podcast, Helen. Yeah, thank you so much, Brian. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I generally like to start by asking our guest, um, what got you interested in history and literature? Why are you doing the research that you're doing? I'm glad that you put history and literature because uh, <laughs> while all of my projects tend to be uh, intellectual histories of literary genres, I'm technically mm-hmm. working out of the English department at Notre Dame. And mm-hmm. um, uh, the first thing oh, I got... Oh, Notre Dame, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I can actually pinpoint the moment at which I got really interested in kind of the history of ideas as tracked through literature. And uh, it was when I was in third grade and I took down my science textbook and uh, I was homeschooled. And so it's a creationist science textbook. And I opened the the page and there I saw this illustration of the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. But in this narrative, there were velociraptors who were fighting over the bones of the 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 past people that the robbers had waylaid and Mm -hmm. the the good samaritan came in and he was riding on a stegosaurus when he came in to help the person who was there in the in the ditch and i saw this and i thought you know wow there must be living dinosaurs today like there there must be them (laughs) they they have to be here and so i asked my parents my parents were like no sorry that doesn't (laughs) i was like but but surely like i see that i see the images here like the story is so vivid and compelling and i completely like i want to know what happened to these dinosaurs and and why does this book say that there were dinosaurs living with the the people in the bible so that that uh question kept me pretty busy (laughs) for a lot of high school where i was trying to understand like what happened to the dinosaurs and also why is it that this story seems like so real but it Mm -hmm. isn't um, so I've always been interested in the way that, that stories and, and really vivid images like that are uh, deployed as rhetoric and the way that that idea kind of changes over time. Cause that, so that book that I had was kind of published in the 1970s at the apex of kind of when um, the, the Christian fundamentalist homeschooling movement had a bunch of really interesting folks who were coming in from like the Jesus movement and the, the Christian hippies. And so there were a lot of like, there were there were some really wacky things that were published around that time, but I didn't know that. I didn't know that when I looked at that uh, picture, uh, the history behind that idea that, that captivated me so profoundly. So that's kind of where I got my, my interest from. And since then, I've just basically been doing the same thing over and over and over again. Is I'll look at some something that, some story 
that's really condensed rhetoric and it orients you immediately within the world and you know what your role is and you know exactly how to respond to this and it moves you to action and I say okay where did this come from how did it change how did we get to this point that's really fascinating I actually come at it from a similar angle to you uh where I think I've t- I might have told this story on the podcast before but I started like history in college like history 101 and we were talking about Muslim women and how like they told stories and like how you could interpret that. And I'm like, hold on a second, you can interpret history. <laughs> so that whole flipping of like trying to understand that I could interpret the history and, and use literature as historical evidence was kind of a really pivotal moment for me too. Yeah. So what specifically are you doing your PhD on as well? Well, I'm doing my PhD on an, it's an intellectual history of depictions of doubt in American mm-hmm. literature um, from the Great Awakening uh, to the Civil War, as I like to say, but it's actually to the American centennial. And so I'm basically tracking how um, early people who talk about doubt are almost always talking about religious doubt. And I'm looking at conversion narratives at first. And in these narratives, doubt looks a very particular way. It's something that's actually good, like God sends you doubt so that you will not be a happy sinner, then you become a Christian. And then Mm -hmm. you're like a really shitty Christian. (laughs) But God sends you down again, and you're like, I should get better. I shouldn't be such a bad Christian. And then you get better over and over throughout your life. So that's like one point of the the trajectory. But on the other end, during the Civil War, there's actually a, a really popular abolitionist newspaper that takes its slogan from um, two lines of a hymn that says to doubt would be disloyalty, to falter would be sin. And so that's that's pretty uh, emblematic. That, 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 that symbolizes well how doubt is being talked about at that point, because doubt means you're part of this group and you're thinking about leaving and going over to that side and they're the enemy and you shouldn't be doing that. Like doubt is really bad. Doubt means you're going to stop being one of us. You're going to lose who you are. So I'm trying to understand what happens to get us from point A to point B. That's really fascinating. Does it kind of start with um, the story of like doubting Thomas or like um, doubting people in the Bible even? Yeah, I'm I'm actually starting with uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Where he's walking down the, the road to the celestial city and along comes giant despair who locks him up in doubting castle and he's stuck there (laughs) and so i'm looking at that vis-a-vis uh obadiah sedgwick's the doubting believer which is 1641 but it's you know read by jonathan edwards and circulated um Mm -hmm. and and so sedgwick's idea is that you're walking through the woods he says you're walking through the woods and you come to a fork in the path and you look down one path and you think this could plausibly be the right way And you look down the other path and you think this too could be the right way. But then because you're not able to decide, you just come to a, you come to a halt and you wait and you look down both ways and you wait for God to tell you which path you should take. I hadn't, I haven't even thought about like how you could like represent doubt. And I think that doing Pilgrim's Progress is probably the best way you have of getting into that angle Um, and how well it plays into, um, I just guess narratives of every, especially evangelical writing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, eventually I'd like to move on and write about like evangelical writing of the 20th century, but I'm told, I'm told that my dissertation is not supposed to span like Bunyan to the present, so. Yeah, <laughs> that's the struggle is like trying to, I just want to write about it all, but uh, I have to really have to finish this PhD, so I need to knit narrow it down a little bit. Exactly, it has to <laughs> so, well, how So how comics then, I guess, is my question. Well, that's also kind of a funny story. Um, there was a time in my life, uh, this was when I was like age 13 to age 16, and I was living in rural Texas um, in a tiny little town, 2,100 people in it. We had one wow. little library, and there were not a lot of books to read. However, someone had donated to the library um, every volume of DC DC's um archive series collection in which they had reprinted all of the golden age uh superman and all of the golden age batman stories and so i decided once i got through looking like for example i wanted to read about ancient greece there was one book about ancient greece and it was something like what if you had lived in the time of alexander the great so i, <laughs> I was kind of starved for material and i lit upon these books and i was like these are really cool i'm going to read all these books 
-hmm. So I got really interested in those. And then in 2008, the Dallas Morning News reprinted um, the first run of the Spider-Man comics. They were, they, they, it was like a facsimile reproduction mm -hmm. of the, the comic books. They'd come in the Sunday papers. And so my siblings and I would fight over who would get to have the latest <laughs> Spider-Man comic. Um, so I, that got me really interested in, in comic books. And so then at, at some point I went to an actual comic book store and I was like, I'd like to buy some more Spider-Man comics. And they said, oh, these are different Spider-Man comics. I said, well, well, why? Like, why are they different? I know Spider-Man, it's been coming in the newspaper. This is what it looks like. It's about Peter Parker and his girlfriend, Gwen Stacy. Like, why, <laughs> why, who's, who's, who's this Mary Jane Watson? Like, why do the, why is the art look different? And that's how I got interested in like, oh, like this act, there's actually a trajectory. <laughs> I like trajectories. There's also there's actually a trajectory here. And it changed. Well, how did it change? And so I started back reading as many issues as I could get to try to, you know, get from, get from what I had seen to what mm -hmm. was being published. I was also super surprised to find out that apparently modern Superman doesn't kill people. Huh. Yeah, you're right. I didn't even think about that. Would you you could almost say that you doubted that you knew Super Spider Man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose everything could come back to doubt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I found too, like when I went to watch the um the the Nolan verse Batman, you know, Batman is so he's so torn because he can't kill because that would be crossing his moral code. And I was like, What are you talking about? You throw gangsters off of buildings. That's what you do. That's what Batman <laughs> You know, and, and so it's been it just fascinated me the extent to which uh, several exemplary characters can be interpreted in so many different ways, in so many different contexts. And they do um, really interesting rhetorical work based on the moment that America is in at the time. That kind of is a perfect lead in to my next question. So I do not actually know that much about comics. I have read a few graphic novels here and there. I read this really fascinating one recently that was like, one if Superman was born in the Soviet Union, and that oh, was like yeah, the, yeah it was like it's Red Red Sun, I think it was called, mm -hmm. and that was like a really fascinating thing. And I, and I've read like um, some other comics in here and there, and I've seen a few of the movies, but I guess I never stopped myself to ask like where these come from. You, you mentioned that um, they kind of tell something about where America was at that time. So I guess where do these come from, and why were they so popular with children? That's a great question. They there's sort of, if we're talking about like clear precursors to what the superhero comic is, there's two, uh, fa there's two like 19th century origins that we can point to. And the first is in the 1840s when graphic narration is, ad is adapted um, from European, especially German immigrants. Because at the time, it's really popular to like very densely illustrate newspapers. And so German immigrants actually in the, in the 40s and 50s start generating news reporting in which they'll do cartoons and some of them are, are political but some of them are humorous and some of them are action based surrounded by text and the it's it's not an illustration in the sense that there's mostly text and here's one or two illustrations the illustrations are the main thing and the text is just to narrate what's happening in that picture mm -hmm. the other uh kind of secret origin of the superhero comic is in 1860 um with the dime novels and dime novels I'm going to talk a little bit about them, but not a lot. But they're generally seen as like the companion genre to superhero comics by cultural historians, um, by moral guardians throughout American history, and by the advertisers who would sell dime novels and superhero comics side by side in newsstands. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about uh, dime novels, I just want to like plant this seed. Remember that DC means detective comics. Okay. And the, the earliest comic books were adapting stories from dime novels and dime novels were almost always about frontiersmen so it's about like and they were they were very violent and actually pretty racist but they were very wholesome because there was no romance there was no sex there was there was there was a lot of internal censorship that was happening by at beetle and adams who's that's the new york firm that um publishes the first dime novel and their slogan a dollar book for a dime uh, sets the marketing philosophy of both the dime novel and the serialized comic books that should be very, very cheap, published on um, newspaper that book historians call ephemera. So the, the materials are, are not meant to last. You're just supposed to have them and read them and they can fall apart. Um, 
and but you're supposed to get a lot of bang for your buck. Like there should be a lot of action here. Mm -hmm. So there's stories about, you know, Davy Crockett going out and fighting the Indians. Or there's stories about in the in the twentieth century it shifts to manly detectives who are uh, you know, Sam Spade types and they're constantly surrounded by corruption and they've got giant square jaws and they're just mm -hmm. forging their way a moral wilderness. And of course, melodramas. We can't forget them with like the, the desperados, the pirates with, with super tight leather pants. And in the 1890s, basically the detective stories become the, the most popular genre. Um, the serialized comic book price and size is standardized in 1919 mm -hmm. by Couple and Leon, where they, they start publishing like square bound paperback books with 52 pages of black and white strips and they're sold for 25 cents. And they're cheap. They're meant to be thrown away. And they're aimed at kids in, in lower and middle class um, households. So they're, they're sold on bus and train stations. Sometimes they're given away in department stores. And initially, they just reprint uh, comic strips from newspapers. Um, 1929 is a big year because that's when George Delacourt uh, publishes The Funnies. And there's a shift to producing original content. Like each one of these books should tell a story that you can't get anywhere else. And as you can tell from the title, um, it's all about detectives. So it's Detective Dan, The Adventures of Detective Ace King, Bob Scully, Two-Fisted Hick Detective. <laughs> so this is this kind of tells you what people want to read and what publishers think they want to read. And this is what they're publishing. And in 1936, um, that's the year that publishing in color becomes basically affordable for publishers. So things start get like the art style starts featuring simple illustrations that can easily be accommodated to the uh the way that the color was printed using using blocks that were carved. Um, so that's that's basically that like that's the prehistory, mm -hmm. and they were basically popular because they were everywhere. They were easy to get, and they were really really cheap. That's fascinating. So that that's gets fascinating. Us, oh sorry. Yeah. Oh sorry. No no go ahead please. I was going to say. I was um, going to say. It kind of reminds me of some of uh, the literature I study, which I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but I study like erotic novels and like erotic literature. But it also reminds yes. me about another podcast we have with Andrew Mangham, who studies like Victorian women in sensation fiction, which uh -huh. I think is like a very similar genre um, in the sense of like disposable literature. So I'm kind of curious, like if you had any thoughts about like how the disposable nature of these things or like how um, how this literature is like so easily like obtained and disposed and not meant to last. Yeah, you no, know, it, it really was kind of like the Snapchat of its day. Um, <laughs> but there have been um, there's been there have been scholars like uh, Jean Paul Jean Paul Gabiet. Now I'm I'm not French and I probably butchered it. Where he talks about how there's um, how about how in England, sensation fiction and the penny dreadful are kind of the counterparts of detective fiction. And the key difference is that in America, uh, basically the publishers are giving very clear instructions to their editors and they're saying violence is okay, but sex is not. No sex. There will not be any sex. There will not be any sex. <laughs> Even if you have to put no women, there's not going to be any sex. So... Um, so Beadle of uh, uh, Beadle and Adams actually gives instructions to his editor and he says, everything that we should publish um, needs to be enjoyed by right-minded people. Hmm. There should be nothing here that will titillate, nothing that will arouse vice in the, the minds of, of the children who will be reading. Mm -hmm. And so that's, to, to me, that's the big difference between types of disposable fiction that were very sensationalist because we can look at things like murder ballads before this or, or broadside ballads that would have you know very gruesome descriptions of people being drawn and quartered and, and, and things like that. But with, with uh, dime novels and with golden age superhero comics, there's a sense that we are here to titillate people, but you can't go too far. So there's, there's a certain kind of internal censorship in which certain kinds of obscene materials are, are off limits from the very beginning. This is a, a little bit skipping ahead and maybe a little bit off topic, but I am actually writing an essay for a book that will be published next, um, next January. Uh, and I'm talking kind of like the feminist critic Joanna Russ. And she wrote this mm -hmm. essay called um, uh, Pornography for Woman by Woman with Love. And she talking about like Kirk and Spock slash fiction, which is like a 
similar study in disposable um, fanzines almost um, in the uh, 1960s and so. And one of the things she points out is like, oh, well, there's no violence. There's there's so much violence in American fiction and literature. And it's almost like that's like sort of an effect of, of, of patriarchy in which like you have to push away like sex through violent act and through um, fear of like homosexuality, for example, is like just pushed away into like really, really violent ways. That's really interesting because that there's someone in 1949 who says almost the same thing. And this is Gershon Legman. Oh, yes, um, I love Gershon. Yes, I was going to say Gershon Legman is, how do I explain this person? Just just Google him. The person who coined <laughs> the phrase, make love, not war, and also the inventor of the vibrating dildo, uh, <laughs> supposedly. Um, but he's also, he's also moonlighting as a moral critic of comic books in his in love and death and he says basically i don't like the fact that there's um so much violence here but sex isn't allowed i think that because you're not allowing anyone to to depict any sexual acts or anything like this that's what's causing this this you know this he calls it an orgy of violence in in pulp fiction in the comic books and so he says um his his uh this quote by the way is picked up by more mainstream and conservative critics mm-hmm. of, of comic books. He says, with rare exceptions, every child in America who was six years old in 1938, which is when um, superhero mm-hmm. uh, fiction explodes and Superman is published in 1938, has by now absorbed an absolute minimum of 18,000 pictorial beatings, shootings, stranglings, blood puddles, and torturings to death from comic books alone. The effect, if not the intention, has been to raise up an entire generation of adolescents, 20 million of them, who have felt thousands upon thousands of times all the sensations and emotions of committing murder, except pulling the trigger. And toy guns and fireworks advertised in the back pages of the comments, comics have supplied that. And so he's pointing out the centrality of how gunplay is linked to the comics, especially in the, the 1930s and 40s. Um, so people who are uh, who are suspicious in the 1950s of comic books effects mm-hmm. publish things like um, there's a famous illustration of Beetle and Adams giving out a loaded pistol with every dime novel, or of every time you pick up a superhero book, you're also with the other hand you're picking up a saber. So there's this there's this sense that even though there's not there's not even there's not supposed to be even a trace of sexual content in this. It's because there's no sexual content that there's so much violence. And there is a lot of violence. Yes. Um, like, let's be absolutely clear. Like, in the gold, Golden Age superhero comics, Superman kills people. He picks up strike breakers and he puts them in a car and throws them off a cliff and they fall down and die. And he, he's shown, he, he picks up uh, German and Japanese spies and he holds them by the scruff of their neck to show his superiority. And he flies through the air and drops them into a canyon. Um, there's a lot of, when people die, when they're shot, there's blood puddles everywhere. There, there's, you know, there's spouting gore. It's, <laughs> it's not something that it would be for children today yeah. with our current understanding of how children should interact with representations of violence. I think I had two separate thoughts. Uh, my first, the first thought was like, uh, I'm working at the Kinsey Institute right now, and I'm reading through all of Gershwin and Legman's letters because we're archiving them because he left them for the Kinsey Institute. But it's just it's oh, fascinating wow. how the, the all these kind of genres tie together in a sense. But your um, point about like how the violent, how violent the acts were kind of does get us back to um, our question here, our topic here. So it's like you mentioned Superman. Was was he the first superhero? Um, like who created the very first superheroes and what were like their powers? Okay, so uh, Superman is the most famous and he appears in 1938 in Action Comics number one. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's a debate about like what what do we mean when we talk about superheroes? How do you define a superhero? And this gets back to the conversations I'm sure you, you had as a child on the playground about like is Batman a real superhero because he doesn't have powers? <laughs> well, you don't have to have powers to be a superhero. So <laughs> so basically, in the 1930s, comic books are being published, and they're often like strips of of uh, newspaper funnies. And there's a mad scramble to find a story formula that would work. In 1934, there's one publisher of comic books, um, Eastern Color. It's the only one. And all of its titles keep going under in a matter of months. This is not good if you're a writer, and it's not good if you're a publisher. Detective stories will sell reliably. We know that. But 
um, if you don't have a compelling hero or a figure that can be its own title, people will get bored of hearing about generic detectives and they won't keep coming to you because they can get a story about a, a detective from a dime novel or, or from any other of your competitors. Um, the frontiersmen are not attracting attention the way that they used to, and they're not going to be the foremost hero type for a long time. There's new fantastic genres that are that are kind of on the rise, but but um, publishers keep coming back to the same problem. You need a compelling, recognizable main character that audiences can relate to. Like the frontiersmen had Davy Crockett. You immediately knew who Davy Crockett was, and you knew what he was going to do. So at the end of 1937. At Popular Comics, which is uh, associated with Eastern Co Color, um, the editor asks his boss to take a chance on two rising stars from Cleveland. This is Jerome Siegel and Joseph Schuster, and they invent the very first um, superhero. They had invented the first superhero in 1934, actually. His name is Dr. Occult, the ghost detective. <laughs> And he's sort of, he's amazing, okay? <laughs> he's sort of a theme of like Sam Spade and the MCU's Doctor mm -hmm. Strange. And he has all these powers that he deploys in order to make him a better uh, detective. He can hypnotize people, which is, is really useful when he's talking to a corrupt witness. He can create illusions. He can astral project. He's got like some mild telekinesis. And these powers are always employed to help him with his detective work. He's just like a super detective. <laughs> but sometimes... When his, powers of dedu deduct when his powers of deduction lead him to suspect that he's dealing with something that's really occult or supernatural, he'll throw off his trench coat and his trilby, and behold, there he is. He's wearing nothing but bright blue underpants, <laughs> red cape, and a sword, which he uses to fight demons. He runs around just like bare-chested. He's got a blue strap across his, his chest. He's super muscular. Um, he's, he basically, like, they use the same body type and, and, and facial features for Superman in 1938. So Siegel and Schuster, they, they, this ghost detective was okay. It didn't do super well, but they have this idea that they keep coming back to. It's their baby. And they keep pitching this idea to syndicates and they keep getting turned down because it sounds too far-fetched and fanciful. And everyone says, who's going to relate to this? And the idea is that uh, just like Dr. Occult can sometimes transform into a more flamboyant personality, that there's this mild-mannered journalist named Clark Kent who's actually an alien from another planet with superhuman abilities. And at a moment's notice, he can transform into this spandex-wearing symbol of American justice and go make things right. And this is Superman. So Superman gets a more iconic outfit than Dr. Occult, and his powers are initially like super strength. And this is not like I can tow a planet super strength as it is in the 60s. Super strength is like I can rip four... Uh, phone books in half with my hand. He's invincible to bullets. He can jump really far, specifically. He can jump a tall building in a single bound. And he has a lot of, like, he's just kind of a wholesome, genial, very good-humored, uh, but invincible person. And his suite of powers changes over time. We can talk about that. But Popular Comics takes a chance on this idea in May 1938. And Superman works. Like, they found the winning formula. The first issue, the editor was as uh, reportedly was appalled because it shows Superman lifting up a green automobile, and he was like, "This is outlandish. No one's going to read this. Who wears clothes like this? Like this is this is stupid, basically." But after the fourth issue, Superman becomes the most popular comic book title. The readership um, goes from two two hundred thousand to five hundred thousand. And young readers are reportedly coming to the newsstand asking for the magazine with Superman. So, of course, when you have something like that, a story that's selling, like magazines are flying off the newsstand, there's going to be a lot of imitation. And so three months later, the Arrow is our first costume crime fighter without powers. And there is basically a ton of imitation Superman. In fact, the historian, the cultural historian of comic books, Jeffrey K. Johnson, says that at one point, um, editors have this down to a science and they say uh, you take a superlative adjective and then you append man or woman to that or you take the name of an animal and you add man or woman to that and then you pull out of the hat <laughs> four or five powers that this person will have and then you think about uh, what the costume design will be and the brighter the colors the better so there's a ton of these there's a ton of these now forgotten uh, names of early superheroes which failed, but Superman managed to basically arrest the public's attention. And of course, Detective Comics 
creates the other, the most memorable non-powered crime fighter in 1939. So this is the superhero who becomes the other big mainstay in the 1940s. His name is the Batman. <laughs> But while Superman is like, he's very genial, nothing ever phases him. He's always in control of the situation. Batman is cold. He's ruthless. He's kind of icily intelligent. He's based off Sherlock Holmes. And, you know, he gives no shits. He's going to do what it takes to get things done. So Batman is definitely a Slytherin in the, <laughs> the Golden Age. So by the fall of, of 1939, the competitors of DC Comics, which would be Centaur, Fox, MLJ, Love Gleason, and Marvel, are all writing superhero uh, characters. And to give you a sense of just of how fast this, uh, this like boom um, takes place, in uh, 1939, there's 22 comic book titles that are being regularly published. Mm -hmm. And by 1940, there's 697. Oh my God, wow. And the majority of these are superheroes as well. Wow, that's, that's a crazy, that's a crazy takeoff. Yeah, isn't, yeah. And that, that's part of what makes the golden age the golden age is that everyone wants to read these things and the superhero comic book it wasn't just that there were comic books and then they started publishing superheroes the fact that they started publishing stories about superheroes is what made the comic book take off as a medium as a, a literary genre in american culture so it's kind of like the chicken or the egg this like the superhero or the comic book exactly <laughs> I was thinking ghost detective sounds I when when you were describing it, it sounds like something out of the sixties, not not the thirties. It's almost strange how like kind of ahead of their time it was. Yeah, there's uh in the sixties there's actually a mining of the thirties for for concepts that they can repackage. Although the sixties, which we can talk about, it depends at which point in the sixties you're talking about and who you're talking about. Because sometimes the sixties are very much in the grip of the the post comic codes authority push to make comic books very safe mm -hmm. and wholesome. And other times they're being written, uh, Marvel Comics in particular, kind of responding to the, the cultural uh, moment of the civil rights era. And so the Golden Age comics really were about teaching young Americans how to be good citizens. Mm -hmm. And we need to do that. And specifically, it needs to look like a progressive vision, opposition to the Vietnam War. Like We use these symbols to generate... Uh, excitement and support for World War II. And now we need to use these symbols to do the right thing again. And that means making a lot of anti-war uh, sentiment very visible in, in these superheroes. So that's why I say the 1960s, things get really, they get really, there's more diverse. I can't talk about what comic books are doing with the same sense of, of broad generalization that I can in, in the 1930s when there's fewer actors in the story and they're all responding to um, very clear uh, pressures, economic pressures and political pressures. That, that was that was actually my next question is um, the 30s is like it's a very rough time for America. I mean, Great Depression worldwide as well. And then the World War Two is um, starting up, isn't it? So like, how did the comic comment on those kind of those cultural shifts happening? They um, they were sort of designed to comment on political shifts from from like from the, the ver from their very inception. So chronologically, Superman leads the pack here. Um, and, and again, this is from Jeffrey K. Johnson. But um, Superman reflects, before we get into World War II, Superman reflects the post-Depression cynicism about economic and social systems in America, but also this hope that there's like a strong unifying government or other form of collective action that can solve the problem. So in his very first appearance, a Superman is positioned as someone who's aligned with the law and he can step in where the law fails. But his goal, like his purpose is to teach people who think they're above the law a lesson. And he says variations on this phrase like multiple times during the, the Golden Age comics. He intervenes in his first appearance. First, there's a woman who's unjustly convicted on false evidence. And basically like the state has failed. There's there's no way at this point that she will not be convicted. So even though things are working as they were intended to, there's a bad outcome. And so he steps in and he proves that she's innocent by um, mm -hmm. beating people up and stealing some evidence. Then he outspeeds a cop and he reaches a mugging victim before the police can. He stops a savage beating, you know, protecting this innocent woman from, um, from a bad actor. Then he overpowers a group of mobsters who have kidnapped Lois Lane and throws them around. And finally, he threatens and harasses an evil lobbyist who's trying to bribe a, a corrupt senator. And the message here is like, no, you should not, with, within this system, I am, a, I am a domestic social forcer of moral good. 
But sometimes in order to do the right thing and to ensure that laws are running the way they're supposed to be, you have to work outside the law. So he's really firmly aligned with the little guy. And he's also aligned with the state in terms of like enforcing law and order. In his first two years, um, his first uh, supervillain is actually the snake. And that's that's later. But his his opponents are usually mobsters or they're corrupt uh, union bosses or they're strike breakers or they're like mad scientists or corporations who are trying to steal or exploit mm-hmm. the brain power of their employees. And so he's always standing up for the little guy and he's usually saying something like, um, this is how things are supposed to be running. But because of you bad actors, you guys are the ones who are bringing America down and I'm going to stop you. So Golden Age Soups also doesn't play. As I said, he kills people. He throws them off cliffs. He knows what needs to be done and he does it. You know, he, there, there's, no, there's never any shade of doubt in Superman's mind. He looks at a situation. He sees the problem. He sees that there are these bad actors who are disrupting law and order and he punishes them and that's it. But he also starts to transition in World War II to thinking not just about domestic political issues, but international mm. uh, wartime issues. It only takes him 10 issues. <laughs> to get there. So in December 19th, this is actually three years before the U.S. joins World War II. And this is at a time when there's not national consensus that joining World War II is the right thing to do. Superman punches a German bomber plane to pieces. And his opponents are, are corrupt, but um, he's starting to face more and more Japanese and German spies and American sympathizers to these spies. So before it's quote unquote popular or mainstream to support the war effort, um, superhero, Superman is telling his audiences directly, um, this is what it means to be a good American. It means making sure that, you know, you look both ways before you cross the street and you, you don't become what, like one of these strike breakers who's bringing us all down. But it also means you need to resist Hitler and you need to stand up to the Axis. Then, of course, in March 1941, we've got the... Uh, kind of the the most prominent mm-hmm. example of this, and this is Captain America. So his first appearance, he's punching Hitler on the jaw. You know the the framing of that piece. He's got the forward action going forward, and Hitler is is going back. Uh, Superman has fought Hitler a couple times by now. Most memorably, one time I think he enlisted some gremlins <laughs> to sabotage Hitler's <laughs> plane, and Hitler fell into the ocean. Um, but but uh, Steve Rogers is. The point at which, like, there's no more subtext. There's no more literary analysis where we think it might be symbolizing this. The text tells us very directly what's happening. So Steve Rogers is a shrimpy boy from New York, and he drinks the super soldier serum that's developed by Dr. Abraham Erskine. And Erskine sees him drink it and transform into this really, you know, buff guy. And he says, we shall call you Captain America, son, because like you... America shall gain the strength and the will to safeguard our shores. At this point, <laughs> there's at this point, like subtlety has left the building about the kind of rhetorical work that superhero stories are designed to do. And before World War II, as I mentioned, Superman and Batman and the others were basically working, they were vigilantes. They were outside the law, working outside the law to ensure that society remained functional and orderly. But during World War II, they transition and they become law-abiding patriots encouraging readers to support the war effort and follow all governmental mandates. So Superman will often appear at the end of, at the, end of the strips. He'll, uh, he'll appear in an unframed um, box with him pointing at the viewer in like the Uncle Sam, I want you, and he'll deliver some kind of moral message. Um, Batman does the same thing. Where he'll remind people, um, you don't have to fight. You don't have to, be, you don't have to fight the Germans to be part of the war effort. You have to remember to uh, bring your tin scraps to a designated recycling place or remember to buy war bonds, kids. So mm-hmm. there's, a very, there's a very interesting um, shift in how they, be, they transition from like violent actors who are enforcing the smooth running of the state to people who are super patriots and they're very committed to the, to the state's security, but they're all focused on um, external threats to the nation. Then in the late 1940s and 50s, though, after we aren't in a war anymore and we're not in a war that's perceived as a popular and just war, uh, the comics get to be more diverse, like super patriots aren't that popular when you're not fighting Hitler. 
Mm-hmm. Publishers start turning to more horror themed comics. They start doing more things that are like horror and fantasy and science fiction, and they start going back to the detective fiction that made um, that made superheroes popular in the first place. But at this time, detective fiction is turned into true crime, which is more gritty and it's more like SV. It's more like the SVU mm-hmm. episodes than it is like Sam Spade. So com- because comic books start to illustrate that, this is what leads us to like the comic, the public comic book burnings and um, Frederick Wortham's book and the Comic Code's Authority. This is what gets us to censorship. Mm-hmm. However, during the Golden Age, superheroes symbolize America. And after what's called the Fall and the Silver Age, superheroes kind of recoup their status as a, a symbol of national identity that can be used to, to make political commentary. This happens in the civil rights era, and then again, sorry, in the Reagan era as well. Mm-hmm. That's. Um, do you think there's any truth to the old theory that comic books kind of worked like Uncle Uncle Tom Cabin in driving America to the war, like they dri- drove America into the first or sorry, the Second World War? You know that that thesis makes sense to me, but I don't think that there's been any um, study that's been done because mm-hmm. I think with with talking about Uncle Tom's Cabin, which I'm much more comfortable talking about because that's area of expertise my time period of expertise we know that uncle tom's cabin was working on people because we can track the way that it was being sold and we have a lot of of data in terms of letters Mm -hmm. and um in terms of what was basically early fandom uh producement of paraphernalia like tons of things that you could wear to show that you liked uncle tom's cabin reenactments like it was it was kind of like Harry Potter in terms of it being a cultural phenomenon beyond the book. Right. And we know that senators were telling us very explicitly, like, I didn't used to support slavery. And after reading Uncle Tom's Cabin, there were so many persuasive arguments. Mm-hmm. I don't know that there's been something like that with comic books in World War II that I could point to. My sense is that you need to do, like, a qualitative analysis yeah. of how many being sold and that's really difficult to track because booksellers like newsstands wouldn't keep track of who was buying which book and where they were going because they're so they're so cheap they're just ephemera so um so what was this golden age of comics that i often hear about okay so the golden age of comics talking about a golden age is a periodization term it's used by both literary scholars Mm -hmm. and historians of the comic book and basically what they mean is the 1930s to the 1950s there's disagreement about when it ends. Some people say it ends 1950, some as late as 1956. Um, most agree that the age, the age that comes after it, the Silver Age, begins in 1956. Because we can kind of track a, a, a cluster of aesthetic and literary and economic changes in that time when DC releases The Flash. Mm-hmm. The Silver Age happens after the establishment of the Comic Code's authority. And in the Silver Age in contrast to the Golden Age. The Silver Age has like fantastical elements, lots of space adventures. There's an aesthetic shift away from the Golden Age's focus on color and contrast. There's an aesthetic shift to price raising shapes, forms, line work. Um, Stories in the Silver Age are more wholesome. Um, They're more sanitized. They're aimed at children who are presumed to be innocent. And this is reflecting a a broader societal shift. Um, I'm not going to talk about Dr. Spock and like the the eras of, of childhood here, but it's connected to a, a shift in how we think about children. Um, this, the Silver Age is the era of Super Friends and the Bat Hound. Um, and it also includes the progressive comic titles um, in during the civil rights movements. It ends circa 1975. Mm-hmm. But the Golden Age is the 30s to the 50s. So what made it golden? And the first, the first thing is, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of new titles. There's like this explosion. There's just excitement with this new genre. Tons of things are being published. Tons of people are reading them. In 19, so as I mentioned, like it goes from like 22 serialized comic books to 697 in one year. Wow. The second is the superheroes replace frontiersmen and detectives as the dominant figure for popular reading for pre-adolescent boys. So before, like. There's a ton of, of scholarship that's been done on the way that the frontiersman registers and sometimes critiques, sometimes reinforces the idea of settler colonialism. Like some of the leather stocking tales, you're not really sure if 
this is being advocated as something that can still be practiced today. This kind of like rough, do-it-yourself, individual, forging my way through the wilderness. Yeah. So the fact that the superhero can displace the frontiersman in the popular imagination is huge. Mm-hmm. And the third thing is, <clears throat> during the Golden Age, superhero stories as, are perceived as doing real work in terms of like the morality of their readers. They're speaking directly to economic anxieties, and they're functioning as wartime propaganda that's accessible, it's compelling, and it's just fun. Mm-hmm. And so for a brief golden time, this genre of literature is assumed by mainstream audiences to have a positive effect on its readership. You don't hear people saying, this is mindless entertainment, it's trash. Uh, you don't hear suspicions about the psychological effects of the medium. Mainstream audiences perceive the superhero comic book as a literary genre that does real work and it has a good effect on children. The superhero comic book teaches you how to be a good American and you should read it. It's good that you should be reading it. And that, I don't think we've ever fully recaptured that level of uh, commitment to the superhero story as a, a unit of rhetoric. No, I would agree with that. That definitely seems um, accurate to, to me. What happens... So you said the Silver Age starts in like 75 and goes through like the Civil Rights era. Is there like a Civil Age that goes into a Bronze Age of some sort? Or how does that process happen? Yeah, so the, the Silver Age starts like 1950s and goes up to 1975. Oh, okay. And then the Bronze Age, they say like most cultural historians of the comic book would would say it's <clears throat> 1975 to 1987. Mm-hmm. And um, at this point superheroes become uh vehicles to think about imperial like american imperialism and global expansionism um and they become a lot more political but in a different way than they were in the golden age because they're no longer reflecting the um they're no longer reflecting uh the values of the mainstream Instead, they're starting to become more niche. And I I can't specifically talk about the Bronze Age as like a homogenous unit Mm -hmm. because things get really diverse. There's some like the like Iron Man um, um, reportedly Stanley said there was so much pressure to create uh, quote unquote progressive superheroes who were anti-war, who are, you know, advocating uh, a new, more equal, almost anti-capitalist way of being in the world. He was like, there was. He felt that there was too much pressure, and so he said, "I'm going to write an anti-hero who is all of the things that you hate. I'm going to make him an asshole. I'm going to make him an alcoholic. He's going to be like a billionaire, and he's going to sell. Um, he's going to sell like uh, bullets and shells, and he's going to be a, a, a war profiteer." <laughs> And I'm going to show you that I can write a compelling character that has all of these things in him because I'm tired of, of having to write the hawk and the dove, you know, part billion. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that's that's an anecdote that's often repeated as a sense of what's happening in the transition from the silver to the bronze age. That um, creators get more interested in um, telling stories that are politically inflicted, but they also want to give superheroes interiority. They want the superheroes to like have doubt and to struggle with the moral decisions that they're making. And they want them to sometimes disagree with the decisions that are being made by politicians and not in the way that super that Superman identifies like this lobbyist and they said, you're a bad actor, you're corrupting the state. Mm-hmm. But sometimes the superhero can be a stand in for not what America is, but what it's supposed to be in, in opposition to what it, it, it is right now. Mm-hmm. And then after the Bronze Age um, comes Watchmen, and some people call it the Modern Age, some people call it the Dark Age. <laughs> um, um, not, not in the sense that it's uh, dark, like, like medieval ages, dark ages, but like the, uh, like the stories get very, very dark. There's this, like, we're free from the Comic Code's authority and we're never going like back. Like T.S. Eliot. We are going to <laughs> yes, exactly. Like, we're going to deconstruct many of the foundational elements of the superhero um, genre and the rhetoric that's supposed to be doing. Like that's that's absolutely what Watchmen is doing. And I'd say that, like from my from my point of view, superheroes have now entered the public consciousness in a new way. And I'd say we're out of we're starting to leave the dark age. You know, I get onto message boards online or I talk with friends who are 
big fans of superheroes as I am, and I find that Watchmen is no longer resonating with people the way it did when I was in college. Mm-hmm. People are saying things that are like, oh, Watchmen, it's, you know, it's like the V for Vendetta, like perceived now as overly cynical and no longer matching what superheroes are supposed to do. And I, I suspect this is because of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like beating the pants off of the DC animated universe mm-hmm. and giving us this vision of, of superheroes being funny and witty and clever. And it's really more about the, the personalities on screen interacting than it is about coming back to some sort of like darkly intellectual reflection about who we are as a nation. You um you mentioned a little bit about that, um, how people's opinions on comics shift after the golden age or after I guess World War II. And I know I'm familiar with the the idea of comic book panics because a lot of my research also got swept up in panics and they're often very often compared to each other. So uh-huh. did I know movies at the time were regulated through the motion picture production code. It, would does something similar exist for comics and how were they like censored or um you mentioned Gershon Legman's like uh, the conservative act- activists moving against comics. So how were comics kind of regulated as a cultural item? Oh, that, that's a great question. Um, yes, there absolutely did exist something that was like the Motion Pictures Production Code. And this was the, um, the Comics Code Authority. <laughs> it's established in uh, 1954. And I'll explain how we, we get to a year, 1954, when there is a blockbusting book or a best-selling book by a Dr. Frederick Wortham, or Wortham, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his last name. So he publishes a book called Seduction of the Innocent, and it's against comic books. And it it sells out like it's a cultural moment. The second thing that happens is that comic books are actually put on trial by the U.S. government, by the, the Subcommittee for Juvenile Delinquency. And the third thing is that the comic book industry decides to establish the Comic Code's authority, because the sense is like, someone's going to crack down on regulating all of this and it might as well be us. We might as well have internal regulations that we can change ourselves at some point in the future if we choose to. Mm -hmm. So how we got to here is basically, as I mentioned in the late 1940s, after the war, interest in superhero stories starts to wane and publishers start uh, diversifying the stories they're publishing and they turn to fantasy horror and true crime as, as three genres that they promote really heavily. The moral backlash emerges to, in response to this diversity of publishing, but it also emerges in tandem with an aesthetic devaluation of comic books, pulp fiction, and dime novels. So in 1949, just the same year that we got that great quote from Love and Death, 1949, Harper's Magazine puts out a chart that ranks different art forms in terms of cultural merit. So you can know, like, if you want to be really highbrow, here's the types of narratives you should be consuming, mm-hmm. and here's the types of fashion you should be wearing, the types of food choices you should be making. In the literature column, there is avant-garde and modernist novels at the top, and at the bottom are comic books and dime novels. And Sterling North tells us that, that the comic books are badly drawn, badly written, badly printed, a strain on young eyes and young nervous systems. Their crude blacks and reds spoil the child's natural sense of color. Their hypodermic injection of sex and murder make the child impatient with better, though quieter, stories. So there's this sense that, like, oh, comic books, they don't do anything. They're, they're just, like, they're garbage aesthetically, and they're garbage morally. Um, so there's a sense, like, Gershon Legman tells us that there's so much violence now in this, and it is becoming more violent, more and more gory depictions of, of true crime effects are being pictured. And he says, like, look, you're, like, giving people guns. That's basically what you're doing. You're causing children to become juvenile delinquents. Mm-hmm. And what's what's really fascinating to me is that this argument was always sort of leveraged around exceptional criminals. So Jesse Pomeroy is uh, 1874. He's a 12-year-old boy. He's a Boston boy fiend. And basically he raped and murdered a number of girls and boys and cut them up in inventive ways. And when they caught him, um, they blamed the dime novels that he was reading on. He was reading as part of wow. where he got those ideas. And at this point, uh, moral, the moral uh, opponents of dime novels are using a mimetic theory of literature to critique Jesse Pomeroy's actions. And they're basically saying the dime novels depict actions that are realistic. And because they're realistic, Jesse Pomeroy got the idea to do this action from this dime novel. And so you're basically replicating actions that are seen to be realistic. And that's that's why this is bad. In the 1950s, 
we've changed from mimetic to psychological theories of, of how literature can act on people. So it's no longer that, um, in the quote that I just read you from Sterling North, Sterling North isn't saying these books, they show children how to rob a store. They show people how to pick a lock. He's saying it's the, it's the art. The art is bad. These crude blacks and reds, they spoil a child's natural sense of color. They, they make the child impatient. And uh, Gershman Legman said, it's not, it's not about depicting acts. It's about psychologically putting you through the paces of doing the murder. He says, you know, the effect, if not the intention, has been to raise up an entire adolescent generation of adolescents who have felt thousands upon thousands of times all the sensations and emotions of committing murder except pulling the trigger. All of this comes to a head with Dr. Frederick Wortham's book in 1954, Seduction of the Innocent. And this book is drawn on seven years of research with juvenile delinquents. And so Dr. Wortham, I should say, as a, as a side point, was overall uh, a decent and humanitarian person who I think just got this one thing really wrong. And it's become the albatross around mm -hmm. his neck in terms of how mm -hmm. he's portrayed in, in history. So the argument of seduction of the innocent is basically uh, many juvenile delinquents read these comic books and dime novels ergo comic books and dime novels are causing juvenile delinquency. And the reason that they're causing juvenile delinquency is because they are psychologically stirring up primal desires for violence and sex in these children in the way, in the, in the, the way that the art positions the viewer vis-a-vis -vis the action that's, that's mm -hmm. depicted. So it's not like Wortham would say it's worse to see a comic book depiction of a hypodermic needle going into a woman's eye than it would be if you saw a photograph of the same act, because it's not that you're getting the idea to do that thing. It's that you're being psychologically primed to do that thing. You're feeling how it would be and you're getting a sort of, of you're, you're kind of getting off on it in some sense. So that's Wortham's argument, like in a nutshell. And he goes, Wortham goes to the Senate Judiciary Committee's subcommittee to investigate juvenile delinquency. as a mouthful in 1954. And this literally puts comic books and dime novels on trial. And the question is, should the federal government create some kind of regulatory code to ensure that these things aren't going to be contaminating our youth? And so Wortham testifies at length that they are and that they will. And so he says specifically as well, I want to make it perfectly clear that there are entire comic books in which every single story ends with a triumph of evil, with a perfect crime unpunished and actually glorified. I can give you so many examples, I would take all your time. And so he says these things, they're, they're appealing to very basic and primal and subconscious psychological desires that are present in all of us. And every comic book glorifies the gratification of these desires and thus this is how comic books are seducing your innocent children and causing them to become juvenile delinquents. And if you read them, your children are going to become like mass murderers and you must burn all of the comic books. And people did burn them. This was the comic book panic. And so what, what I find fascinating about this is that it's not just about the acts that are being represented. There's a panic about how the acts are being represented, this kind of hyper-realism that they, they call it, that you can kind of zoom in and focus on this particular aspect of the act and not this, the, the, other, the other aspects. You never see the fallout. You never see the person coming to terms with the guilt of what they've done. That's an argument that's advanced for, for why the comic book is not good. Mm -hmm. So in response to that, the comic code's authority is put into place. And here's, here's some content that's banned by the comic codes. Here's, here's what it does. Um, so it says... Crimes shall never be presented in a way to create sympathy for the criminal, to promote distrust of the forces of law and justice, or to inspire others with a desire to imitate criminals. Mm -hmm. If crime is depicted, it shall be as a sordid and unpleasant activity. There shall be little aesthetic detail committed to it. In every instance, good shall triumph over evil, and the criminal shall be punished for his misdeeds. Scenes of excessive violence shall be prohibited. No comic magazine shall use the word horror or terror in its title. <laughs> All lurid, unsavory, gruesome illustrations shall be eliminated. Um, suggestive, salacious illustration or suggestive posture is unacceptable. And then here's one that it seems was never actually, it was never actually put into uh, play. Females shall be drawn realistically without exaggeration of any physical qualities. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. 
So that's the the Comic Codes Authority, which is put into to place in um, 1954, mm-hmm. uh, just December 24th, 1954, and it cuts back the number of comic books that are being published by by quite a yeah. lot. There's a lot of things that were due to be published, and they're they're taken off. And then um, there are things like, and again, I wish I could share images with you. You can share them. Uh, you can share them in the thread when we post the um, post this podcast. <laughs> you're welcome to share the images there. Oh, perfect. Well, there were there there were many uh, images that were were redrawn covers of comic books that were set to be released in uh, the next year. So, for example, um, one picture shows Captain America behind a uh, sort of artistically enlarged red skull, and the skull does indeed look quite gruesome and scary. And Red Skull's hand is out, and it's this greenish, like, monstrous hand that's grabbing people. And in revision, the skull had to be significantly simplified, so it looked more cartoonish and less, less uh, threatening. The hand is now playing a kazoo, and it's no longer grabbing a person. And the hand is now flesh-colored instead of me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, and I forgot to say, the, the, the other thing that happened to you was, uh, uh, was Bucky Barnes does not MCU Bucky Barnes. This is Bucky Barnes, the plucky boy sidekick. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Bucky Barnes's costume was also changed so that less attention was directed towards his um, star-spangled <laughs> Um I guess that kind of brings us towards a general end, but I kind of wanted to try to draw us towards a conclusion. What do you think listeners can take away from the history of comics? Um, what can we learn from the history of comics that we apply to our modern day? Wow, that's a that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> what can we learn from all of this? Well, I think the first thing that we can learn, I mean, we have the thing that we didn't get to talk about is the moral outrage over uh, comics today, which are often coming from people who uh, feel that you know feminists are taking over comic books and that there's some sort of you know terrible conspiracy to take away from us this art that we love so much and that we've all grown up on. Um, and to make it worse in some way, or or there's the, there's also an argument that I've seen advanced uh, in many circles recently that comic books shouldn't be doing political art, especially uh, especially not even comic books, but superhero stories play on the big screen. That there shouldn't be a political takeaway. That this is about fun. This isn't about politics. We should leave that at the door. And so the first takeaway we can say is that first of all, there's always going to be somebody who's upset or threatened by by comic books. We have mm-hmm. a long history of, of moral reactions of people who think the genre should be like this and not like another way. And the fact that there's such a strong reaction to it, I think can point up to us um, the power that these kind of stories have to help us think through our identity a- as people and, and in terms of groups. You know, it's it can point up the fact that the superhero story is a very special kind of of rhetoric in the american cultural imagination and people care a lot about how that looks and there are real stakes i don't want to see you know spider-man be i don't know turned into some sort of like person that i'm not i i want him to keep being like me because i related to that character like there were times in my life when i i thought about spider-man and i felt like he validated me he knows how i feel like i like that i've invested part of myself in these in these characters and these symbols. And Mm -hmm. that's what makes them really, really powerful. And that's what gives them the potential to do real uh, political commentary. And the second takeaway is that superheroes are political by their very nature. They were created as symbols to think about American identity. And because politics is the transition of power, um, Hmm. we're going to get political about this one way or the, or, or another. And so maybe instead of saying we need to cordon off this genre from anything that could be didactic or moral or political, there shouldn't be a point to any of this. We should just think more um, in in a more ethical and nuanced way about what kind of work we want to do with our superheroes. I have one final question, which is which superhero would you be? (laughs) Which superhero would I be? Yeah. If I could be any superhero. Yes. Wow. (laughs) The hardest question I'll yet. You, I'll tell you the truth, I hadn't really thought about this. But if I could one, um, I think I'd be the Black Widow. Okay. Why's that? Yeah. You know, she's she's good with words and she has red hair like me, so. There you go, you're up for there. 
Well, thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. Um, I was so pleased to have you on, but I'm sure with like any really interesting topic with this, there will be lots of follow-up questions in the follow-up thread on Ask Historian. So I hope you will come and join us there. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to share my passionate opinion about the history <laughs> my passionate expert, well-researched and backed with facts. <laughs> about the history and future of uh, the superhero story and uh, look forward to seeing you on Ask Historians. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history. (laughs) 